Good morning. It's good to see you here. I'm glad that we can be together once more, have this opportunity to be able to worship our Lord in spirit and in truth. I want to encourage you to keep your Bibles open to Acts chapter 9, and in particular, verse 5. That's where we're going to spend most of our time today, at least as we begin. And I want to share a lesson with you that I've entitled, Who Art Thou? Now, before we get to that, I, will want, I just want to remind everyone that today is the day that we are beginning to uh, collect the number of chapters that we are reading each week. So if you haven't had a chance to put your number in the box, uh, I'd encourage you to do that before you leave today. And Lord willing, tonight we'll have a total and we'll see how many chapters we were able to read as a congregation this week. And if you didn't get started this week, that's okay. Get started today, and uh, you'll be ready for, for next week. But we want to encourage each other to be in the Word of God. I imagine that most of you are very familiar with Acts chapter 9. It is the chapter in God's Word that tells us of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Here was a man who was a persecutor of the church. And yet we're going to learn of his obedience to the gospel and how this one who, who had been so devastating to the Lord's church became one of its greatest champions in preaching and teaching the gospel. This event evidently is so important that it's not only just recorded here, but it's also recorded for us in Acts chapter 22, and again in Acts chapter 26. And when we put all the pieces together from those accounts, we learn of Saul going on his way toward Damascus. As he got near the city, there was a great light, and Jesus speaks to him. Now, he doesn't know that it is Jesus at the time, but Jesus explains that he is the one who is speaking unto Saul, and that he has been persecuting him. In persecuting the church, you persecute Jesus. Saul asked the question, What wilt thou have me to do, Lord? You know, many people have Saul saved on the road to Damascus. When he saw the light, we even have an expression that people use, I saw the light. Is that when Saul was saved? No. No, Jesus tells him, you go into the city and there it will be told you what you must do. Isn't that interesting? There's something that you and I must do in order to have salvation. He waits for three days. He spends that time in prayer and fasting. And a servant of God, a man by the name of Ananias, is sent to him, gives him back his sight. That light had blinded him. And then he tells him to arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And of course, that's exactly what Saul does. And he becomes a child of God. I imagine that most of us have heard many lessons about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And that's a very valuable study. But that's not what I want to focus on this morning. Instead, I want us to think about the question that Saul asked when he first addressed Jesus, the one who was speaking to him. He says to him there in verse 5, Who art thou, Lord? In the New King James Version, it says, Who are you, Lord? Who are you? That's what I want us to think about. Now, if you have a handout, you may notice that there are several spaces to be filled in. In fact, there are ten. I don't normally preach lessons that have ten points to them. We're not going to spend a lot of time on those. I think the last time that I did, I made the statement that maybe 10 points is too many, but that's what we're going to have. And when I got home, my nephew, Matthew, said, Tim, 
Uncle Tim, you were right about one thing. I said, what's that? He said, ten points are too many. But I promise we won't spend much time on each one today. But I just want us to examine what the Bible reveals to us about who Jesus is. Now, certainly this isn't everything the Bible says. But let me share these thoughts with us. Who art thou, Lord? Well, we can begin by noticing, first of all, He is deity. We need to understand that Jesus is God. He is God the Son. The Bible makes it very clear that there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is deity. In Revelation 1 and verse 8, We find Jesus saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Jesus has all the qualities of deity. He is eternal in nature. I realize that a question that people often have about God is where did he come from? What's the answer? He didn't come from anywhere. He has always been, and he always will be. Jesus, being God the Son, is eternal in his nature. He is omnipotent. He is the Almighty. He has all power. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing, including what is in every person's heart. He knows all, and he is all-present. There is no place that you can go to escape the presence of the Lord. Saul asked, Who art thou, Lord? The Bible says, He is deity. But not only does it tell us that, it tells us that he is creator. When you look again at the accounts that are given throughout God's word of the creation, we see that Jesus was instrumental in it all. In fact, in John 1, in verses 1 through 3, we're going to read, In the beginning was the word. Later, we identify that word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We're talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He is the creator of all things. This is given to us again in Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. That is, he is the cause of every creature. He is the one who has brought them forth. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. Not only is he the creator, but he is the sustainer of all creation in heaven and in earth. And so who art thou, Lord, Saul asked. He's deity, and he is creator. But not only that, he is the Son of God. He is identified as such throughout the Scriptures. You may remember when Jesus was baptized of John the Baptist in the Jordan River. After he was baptized... The Spirit of the Lord descended upon him in the form of a dove. And God the Father speaks from heaven above. Matthew 3 and verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. 
He is the Son of God. And my friends, when he made that claim, when he talked about God being his Father and he being the Son of God, the people of his day understood what that meant. They understood it to mean he was putting himself on equal ground with God the Father. It's one of the reasons why they were trying to put him to death. When he claimed to be the Son of God, he was saying, I am deity. In Matthew chapter 14, we read about Jesus feeding the 5,000. When he does so, he sends his apostles afterwards across the sea before him. And then he dismisses the people. He goes up on a mountain apart by himself and prays. And then later that night, I think the Bible tells us it's the fourth watch of the night, he begins walking on the water. There's a storm that the disciples were facing. And when they see Jesus, they think he is a ghost, a spirit. But he tells them, be not afraid. It is I. This is when Peter says, if it's you, Lord, let me come out unto you. And Jesus says, come. Peter walked on the water for a time until he began to focus on the wind and the storm, and he began to sink. Of course, Jesus saves him. And when he gets to the ship and they enter in, the storm ceases. And when you get to verse 33, you see the response of his apostles. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Reminding us again that Jesus is deity. But not only is he the Son of God, he is the Son of Man. And this reminds us of his humanity. You know, when people try to, try to understand the nature of Jesus upon the earth, you will hear some try to say something like, well, he was part God and, and part man. Or maybe 50% God and 50% man. But folks, that doesn't get it. Jesus is the God-man, a hundred percent of both. And I know that that adds up to 200 percent. And some would say you can't have that. You can in Jesus. And that's what you have. He's the Son of God, but He is also the Son of Man. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 11, He would say, for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. It speaks to us of his humanity. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, we're reminded of that humanity that he took upon himself so that he could suffer for you and for me. There the writer would tell us, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Who art thou, Lord? He's the Son of God, but He is also the Son of Man. Now, let's think about this. You think about who Jesus is. We can think about the names that are given unto Him. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is significance to every description that is given there. First of all, He is Jesus. You remember what the name Jesus means, right? It means Savior. And that's what He came to be for you and for me. You may remember in Matthew chapter 1, where Joseph is bringing Mary to, to Bethlehem. This child is going to be born. He was going to put her away privily, the Bible tells us. But that night, an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream and explains to him that the child that is conceived is of the Holy Ghost and that she is going to bring forth this child and that his name is to be called Jesus. Why? 
because he will save his people from their sins. He is the Savior. He is Jesus. You know, in Acts chapter 4, about verse 10, we find Peter and John being questioned about the miracle that they had performed and, and the preaching that they'd been doing. And they explain. Why, if you want to know how it is that this lame man is now walking, it is by the power of Jesus. Jesus whom you crucified, that God has raised up. And as they spoke of Jesus as Savior, they would go on and say, according to verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That name is Jesus. He is Savior. Who art thou, Lord? He's Jesus, but he is also Christ. What does that name mean? You remember? It means anointed one. In Greek, we have Christ that carries that idea. In Hebrew, it is the term Messiah. And so in the Old Testament, we have this idea that the Messiah is coming. Christ is coming. Jesus is the Christ. You think about that idea of being anointed. And in the Old Testament, think for a moment about who it was that would receive anointing. Kings, right? Kings would be anointed. Priests, they, they would be anointed. Prophets at times were anointed. And here is Jesus, prophet and priest and king, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. John chapter 4, we find Jesus talking to that Samaritan woman at the well. And once she comes to the realization that he is at least a prophet, we find her talking to Jesus in this way. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Jesus claims, I am the Christ, the anointed one. You remember the sermon that Peter gives on the day of Pentecost as he would tell the people of Christ and of God's plan and the unfolding of that plan and how they had crucified the very Son of God. And when he gets to verse 36... It's really the climax of his lesson. He tells them, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Who art thou, Lord? He is Jesus, and he is Christ. But he is also Lord. He is Lord. He is King of Kings. He is our ruler, our master. It's interesting to me that when you think about the idea of Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, so many, so many want Jesus as their Savior. But so few of that number want him as their Lord. They're not willing to do what the Master has told us to do. Jesus, I want you to save me and leave me alone. Just let me live the way that I want to live, but in the end, you save me. They're not willing to say that he is Lord. And if they do profess it, they're not willing to live it. But folks, it just doesn't work that way. If Jesus is to be our Savior, he must also be our Lord. You remember the first time that Thomas is able to see Jesus 
following his resurrection. He had made the claim, I won't believe unless I can put my finger into the, the print of his hand or unless I can thrust my hand into his side. And a week later, when Jesus appears, he tells Thomas to do those very things. Not to doubt, but to believe. And that's when Thomas falls to his knees. He worships the Lord. And before him he says, my Lord and my God. Thomas understood that Jesus is Lord. There's a verse that always has stuck in my mind when I think about this idea of Jesus being Lord. And it's Luke chapter 6 and verse 46 where Jesus asked a question. And that question is, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? We really cannot say that Jesus is our Lord unless we're willing to submit to his, his will. Remember, Jesus is the one who tells us, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Who art thou, Lord? He is Jesus Christ. He is Savior. He is the Anointed One, the Messiah. He is our Master. The next thing I want to share with you is this. He is our High Priest. You think about the work of a High Priest, and there were many aspects of the work under the Old Covenant, but in particular, you might recall the idea of the part that they played in making sacrifice, atonement for the people. And Jesus has made sacrifice for us, but it would not be a ram or a lamb or a bull. No, God gave to him a body. And he would lay down that once for all time sacrifice for you and for me. He is our high priest. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, we are told, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of of the people. It's what a high priest does. Makes atonement, reconciliation. And he did that by laying down himself. Hebrews 4 and verse 15 reminds us, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of, of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Who art thou, Lord? He is our high priest. And then he is also the one who makes intercession for us. Someone who makes intercession, an intercessor, is one who, who intervenes on the behalf of others. And the Bible makes it clear that that's exactly what Jesus does for us. He intervenes on our behalf. In Hebrews chapter 7, in verse 25, we are reminded, Wherefore? He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's able to make that intercession for us through the blood that he shed. The blood that washes away our sins. I like the way that it's talked about in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, where we're reminded, my little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. An advocate. Well, what's an advocate? That's someone who pleads your case. In our legal system, it would be your lawyer. 
who is defending you, the one who is pleading your case, Jesus, who is making intercession for us. Who art thou, Lord? Yes, he's our high priest, and he is our intercessor. Let me share one more with you. He is our judge. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, we're reminded of this great truth. It is given as an encouragement that we might prepare ourselves for that great day. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. He is our judge. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1 reminds us, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. The first time that our Savior came, He came to save us from our sins. But when He comes again, He will come as our judge. And that's why we need to make preparation now so that we are ready to stand before our Lord. I know that we went through those things pretty quickly. But I hope that they give us some idea as far as an answer goes to this question that Saul of Tarsus asked so many years ago on the road where he saw that light. He doesn't know who it is that's speaking to him. And so he said, Who art thou, Lord? The simple answer was, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But when we open our Bibles, we learn so much more about who Jesus really is. Folks, this morning we've looked at this question. Who art thou, Lord? Let me close with just one more. Who are you? I'm not talking about what your name is. Who are you? And this morning... If your first answer was not, I'm a Christian, or I'm a child of God, let's change that. Let's change that right now. And because of who Jesus is, it can be changed. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Savior. He's the Messiah, the Anointed One. He is our ruler, our Master. Are you willing to submit to his will? Who are you? Can you say today, I'm a Christian? If not, don't leave this place in the same condition that you came. Come to Christ with that penitent heart, believing that he's the Son of God. Confess him that you will live that great profession. And then be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. In the name of Christ. Salvation cannot be found in any other. We know who he is. Who are you? Folks, if you need to make a change, will you do that today? If you're subject in any way to the invitation of our Lord, please come as together we stand and as we sing.